Welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism. And that month is quickly drawing to an end. Uh, we have three more events after today's event. Uh, so let me clue you into those first. At 3 p.m. this afternoon, Money and Capital in the 21st Century with Paul Maddock, Jamie Merchant, and Tony Smith. Uh, Tuesday at 11 uh, a.m. Pacific Time, uh, we have Late Fascism with Alberto Toscano, Robin Marasco, and Nikhil Pal Singh. And on Wednesday at uh, 11 a.m., uh, we have the legal crisis in Chile. Uh, so uh, do check our website. Uh, uh, all those events will be online. Uh, but now I'm happy to uh, introduce today's event, uh, which is uh, Bolivia and the New Pink Tide in Latin America. That was actually the, the, the alternate title, but it got, the real title of the event got lost in the shuffle. Uh, maybe Michael will uh, uh, illuminate us. We have uh, with us today uh, Michael Hart, uh, one of the godfathers of, well, the godfather of Red May. I, I like to think of him that way. <laughs> Though he's never offered me a deal I couldn't refuse. Uh, Michael uh, teaches at Duke, has uh, so many books with one word titles like Assembly, Commonwealth, Empire. Uh, it's really a, a blessing for anyone who has to introduce him because they're easy to remember. As a new book coming about, uh, out about the 70s, what is, what's the title of that again, Michael? The, the Subversive 70s. The Subversive 70s. It's, it's wonderful. I've got a chance to read it. Uh, uh, Sandra Mazadra, uh, Michael, uh, Michael's partner in crime, uh, and also his uh, partner who, in a, who went to Bolivia uh, together for a trip uh, last summer. Uh, I proposed Michael and Sandra's excellent adventure after the Keanu Reeves movie, but they, they vetoed that. Uh, Sandra is the author of Order as Method, The Politics of Operations in the Marcian Workshop. Uh, he uh, teaches in Bologna, or is from Bologna, where they have the best food in Italy, believe me. Uh, uh, Jeff Weber is back at in Red May. Anybody who has studied Bolivia has read uh, many of Jeff's books. Uh, my favorite title is Red October because people mix it up with the Tom Clancy book. So we get a couple of right-wingers in there who are then seduced by the pros. So Jeff, welcome back to uh, Red May. And uh, I'll turn it over to Michael to, have it, to, to start it off. Thanks, thanks, Philip. Uh, one, one of the ways we want to start, it, start was, was really for each of us very briefly to um, just give a few words about uh, why Bolivia and 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 why it's held our interest and that's our in our political interest um before then proceeding to both talk about um the recent history of bolivia in the context of the latin american left and then also about the contemporary political situation um and i could maybe i'll just say 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 two words my about i mean i i in part um have to think, I think of Bolivia and my own encounters with it in the context of my enthusiasm about the um, the Latin American left in many countries starting in the, the late 1990s or the early 2000s. And, and Bolivia in particular has been, it says, has been for me a uh, focal point of that, of that engagement, partly because of the uh, intermixture of Marxist and um, idea, theories and, and practices of indigenous liberation. It's been the Andean context um, with the Marxist traditions has been um, super exciting to me. Um, Bolivia is a uh, majority indigenous nation. It's, uh, or series of nations with, I believe 27 ethnic uh, groups and nationalities with different languages, and it very—it's one of those countries in which it's very hard to uh, define what constitutes an indigenous population. By, uh, but it, but something in the neighborhood of seventy or eighty percent of the population identifies in one way or another as as indigenous. So it's it presents a fascinating possibility of thinking about the um, the relations between communist liberation and um, 
indigenous forms of liberation. At least that's one aspect of why of why for me. Um, Jeff next, and then Sandra, or okay, sure. Uh, so the the personal part first was um, I was I was doing a, a master's degree uh, at, at McGill uh, studying uh, urban unemployed workers movements in Argentina. Um, and so I was going to Argentina, but then I thought I would start the trip in Bolivia and and go to Chile before I went to Argentina. Uh, and I made these plans prior to the Cochabamba water war, but then um, just as I was arriving, the Cochabamba water war it had just finished. So I wasn't there for that, but, um, but the, the aftermath of that was still, it was very exciting to be in the, in the country. Um, which I didn't know uh, enough about uh, upon my arrival, but I stayed much longer than than I had intended to. And then I went back virtually every year and lived there in 2005, 2006 for my, what became my 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 doctoral dissertation and so on. And, um, but over the course of those years when I became much more familiar with Bolivian history and so on, the attraction was also that in addition to what Michael was saying about the sort of uh, complex combinations of left and indigenous insurrectionary history. Um, the there's also an interesting dynamic in the sense that the majoritarian Marxist movements of the 20th century in in Bolivia and only in Bolivia and Latin America were were explicitly uh, anti-Stalinist. Um, that is to say, it was Trotskyists and anarcho-syndicalists ran the the tin miners unions, not the not the uh, Bolivian Communist Party, so that was a very unique situation, and and I think it 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 played into some of the incredible dynamism of what came after, because the collapse of the Soviet Union wasn't such a crisis for them in the same way that it was for uh, for other movements. So that's another another reason I think for why Bolivia has such a uniquely militant history. Uh, both recent and and of longer duration. I also spent quite a lot of time in Argentina in the early 2000s. It was a, a great tumultuous uh, moment. And so I got involved uh, in Argentinian and Latin American <clears throat> politics. It was something very clear uh, uh, in those years. Uh, uh, there was a new uh, Latin American scale of uh, political action, and uh, it was a scale uh, directly produced by movements uh, and uh, uprisings between uh, the end of the 20th century and the beginning uh, of the 21st century. Mm. Uh, I uh, got interested uh, in Bolivia quite soon because at the time uh, I was uh, kind of studying colonialism, post-colonialism, so the indigenous issue uh, was very important to me. And uh, I remember thinking of uh, the uh, water and uh, gas uh, wars uh, in the early 2000s in uh, Bolivia. And uh, I realized that uh, Bolivia had been considered uh, until uh, that moment as a kind of marginal uh, uh, country within a semi-peripheral uh, region. Uh, the gas and war, uh, uh, the gas and water wars. <laughs> Uh, made it uh, kind uh, of uh, uh, important reference, uh, not only uh, at the regional level, but also in uh, global left politics. So it was a kind of reshuffling of the, the, the relation between uh, periphery and center that seemed to me a kind of theoretical uh, event in a way. Mm -hmm. The um... You know, it might be just to introduce the next topic, and I'm not sure if uh, I, I hope for the those viewing, I'm not being too um, whatever explaining too much. But the but the both Jeff and uh, Sandra referred to the uh, to the wars on water and gas from 2000 and 2003. 
um, which were essentially anti-neoliberal uh, popular uprisings against the privatization of water, against the privatization of gas in different parts of the country. But the point is uh, that I thought would be helpful for the next stage of discussion is that both in Bolivia, but also throughout the, the inspiring left movements in Latin America in that in this first wave in that period in the early 2000s, it was uh, left governments came to power in Venezuela, in Argentina, Uruguay, Bolivia, and other countries. Left governments came to power on the backs of these social movements. Like so, it was the movements that led and the governments that that followed, and then began. I think a very complicated relationship between the progressive governments that came into power and uh, the movements themselves. So part of what I'm part of what I'm hoping we can get to in the in the course of the um, of our discussion today is the relationship between what we were all inspired by of this first uh, Latin America wide uh, social movement dynamic with progressive governments from 20 years ago and the relationship today and the possibilities for today. But before getting to the possibilities for today, I thought it might be helpful to go back um, and think about this period, either in Bolivia or in at a regional level, whichever you two are more interested in, about the dynamics then. So for Bolivia, it's now post 2005, 2006. So Evo Morales is elected the first indigenous president in 2005, takes office in 2006, and then begins a decades, you know, longer than a decade um, governmental process in which the government is seen in some sense as representing the movements or it conceives of itself as representing the movements and uh, and in some ways during that period denounced by them. I thought it might be helpful for me, but you guys should turn to other things that I'm leaving out that you're more interested in, if that's right, to think about what some of the limitations and accomplishments of the uh, government that um, that that resulted from this period, that resulted from the movements, you know, led by Evo Morales as president. Uh, what the characteristics are of those of those years, um, you know, accomplishments, limitations, for instance, in terms of indigenous empowerment, could be one question about the uh, questions of economic development or transformation, however we're going to think about this, and also the relationship between the state and the social movements, which is obviously a complicated dynamic during this period. Um, maybe I'll just say one word about this. I mean, there's, there's way too much to, to think about what I'm just proposing. One is that it, it seems to me, ah, actually, one other thing I want to bring up about this before going on, which is that I'm also struck by, and I'd like to hear what the two of you think about this too, that, that the... It was during these these fifteen years, you know, of the Evo uh, Morales Alvaro Garcia Linera government, a constant threat and presence of the right in Bolivia, a, a threat of of reaction and violence, which was sometimes submerged and sometimes overt. And if we get to and if we get to talking about the two thousand nineteen, uh, what I conceive of as coup d'état. Uh, against the uh, the that government, um, it could be interesting. But I guess I would qualify all the for me at least the accomplishments and limitations. For me, always have to be put in the context of that um, of that threat of the right wing uh, government. Okay, that said, one of the things that I I take for granted, but maybe the two of you don't, is that there there's been during the, this period, a real, I mean, transformation is maybe the wrong word, but a significant increase of indigenous participation and empowerment within the government and in within, within the economic spheres. Um, and even at the, the banal cultural level of, of, the, um, of just a kind of everyday racism of, you know, the, um, Against against indigenous populations, um, you know there are of course limits to this, but but just the the number of um, indigenous populations within the governing structures, within the administration, um, the for better or for worse um, indigenous forms of capitalism that that have that have grown up, along with the traditional structures about peasant unions, etc. Um, 
I would, I mean, there are a lot of things I think I would want to criticize the government about for this, but I, I would start with just that recognition and even the symbolic level of the first indigenous president. I mean, maybe for U.S. viewers that you could put it some way parallel to Obama. I mean, there was, in a sense, a great deal of criticism, a great deal of, of um, what you call it, unrealized hopes from it. But the simple significance of the indigenous president seems to me, Jeff is much closer to the reality of Bolivia than I am, but seems to me like a, one of those, a, a kind of baseline important fact. Anyway, that's what I, I just wanted to start with. One aspect of this, which seems to me um, an accomplishment of the of these twenty years uh, around indigenous participation and and, and empowerment. Should, should please, next? yeah, please, yeah, 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 or yeah. Um, so the. Yeah, maybe I'll try to think about, I mean, focus my comments on, on Bolivia, but try to situate it a little bit in, all, like you were suggesting, in the um, Latin American wide context. Um, and in addition to the, like, I'll, I'll try to speak to some of the points you raised, but also bring in a, a little bit of maybe more emphasis on dynamics of capitalist accumulation and in the world market, because I think these were, these quite crucial in determining, helping to determine both what was possible, but but also the dynamics of, of limits and possibility. The I think crucially there was a there was a region wide economic crisis between ninety eight and two thousand two. When I say region wide, it was really sub regional. It was South America that where the, there was a very deep recession between ninety eight and two thousand two, almost without. I mean, at an aggregate level, obviously it was uneven, um, but it affected almost all countries in the region and it was very, very sharp in Bolivia and, and also famously in Argentina. Um, and so that was the context in which, um, you know, it was the real kind of culminating economic uh, collapse of the legitimacy of neoliberalism as a project, which didn't mean that there was some alternative obviously available, but, it, but clearly this couldn't go on more of the same. And the, the, the center right and right governments that were leading everywhere were promising more of the same. So there was a, there, there, this is where things began in, in a serious way, in, in my reading of, of temporality. I mean, you could go back further, the Zapatistas, the, the Caracaso in, in Venezuela. The, but, but in general, I think that's a clear breaking point. And in the, in the, so in other words, a crisis of capitalist accumulation, which experientially in South America was equivalent in depth to uh, to the earlier uh, debt crisis of the 80s. It was very, very serious and underplayed in most accounts of, of, of how this came about. And so the first kind of resistance in Bolivia starts with the 2000 Cochabamba water war. And then as people were talking about, it builds into the 2003, 2005 gas wars and so on. And, and it articulates in different ways rural and urban left indigenous coalitions with a series of demands. And I think, you know, some fairly breathtaking uh, anti-capitalist, not merely anti-neoliberal demands coming from the leading edges of the Bolivian case, which, which I think marks out Bolivia's singularity. It's true that Bolivia was inside of this wider dynamic, but I don't think it can just be sort of collapsed into what was happening everywhere else it, it was only in bolivia i think that there was a that there was uh, at this time at least serious anti capitalist elements to the and not merely anti neoliberal elements to the to the demands coming from below um, you know there's a debate around that but that's my reading of it and so if you think my my position on the uh, on the, on the, I mean, it's very hard to synthesize success and failure of, of a very long period of Morales government and so on. And then our say that in the Morales government, I think, you know, we need to situate this in, in two different ways. To put it crudely in, in economic terms, it was, it was very important that, that Morales assumes office not in a period of crisis of capitalist accumulation, but in the period of dynamic capitalist accumulation, very distinct than, than the period that brings that, that brought the social movements 
into four sort of five years, it was a very different moment driven by Chinese industrialization, commodities boom, et cetera, right? So gas exports, soy exports, mineral exports are booming. And so one of the, and this was, I mean, superficially this was a gift, but, but, <laughs> but it was much more complex than a gift because um, uh, it, it allowed a certain um, delay of class questions being, being posed because you could lubricate certain class contradictions with easy state revenue, uh, much easier than it had been in 25, 30 years. So in other words, net capital accumulation could continue, net profits for all of the MNCs that are there, at the same time as you achieve certain serious and important livelihood improvements for the, for the poor. But these things were never going to last. This is sort of this virtuous circle for all for all elements of that were operating in the Bolivian economy. And so, but that, and, and, but the first period also was where the most transformative gestures at least had to be made because of the strength precisely of the left indigenous cycle that preceded it. So the, the, the so-called nationalization of gas, it has to be so-called because it, it wasn't nationalization in any traditional sense of that term, but there was, there was an increase in royalties and increase in taxes there's a kind of rebooting of the National Gas Company, although it's exaggerated in certain accounts. But nonetheless, there was that was a big that was a big gesture, um, and it had very significant implications for just seizing more of the revenue going to the state that was being generated by the gas industry, which then trickled out into various parts of of economic development. So. And the other was the constituent assembly, although it didn't take it didn't assume the form that that many had wanted it to assume. It, it nonetheless was a requirement of the Modales government. There's no way that there was not going to be in the constituent assembly because it had been a demand since, well, for a very long time, but especially since 2000. So that was all in the first period. And even though I my reading uh, of the Modales period is still one of passive revolution that is read in the sense of of primarily containing and transforming potentialities into something less than what, what it might have been. Nonetheless, that was the most, if you want, progressive period of the Morales era, um, the biggest achievements. It, whether we read it as this, as something that Morales did <laughs> or something that he was he, he was driven to do, it's nonetheless the case that those that's when it occurred. That's when the, the most dramatic improvements in, in people's lives occurred. Uh, and on the indigenous and right question, just to be brief on this, the to be brief on on what are very difficult topics, I think uh, on the indigenous question, um, there is a uh, I think one of the things that the Morales government did, uh, represents as, as an achievement was what Michael is gesturing at, um, you know, the first self-identified indigenous. Indigenous president coming to office because there's, there's questions about previous Bolivian presidents, how they were understood by others, but um, uh, but you know proudly identifying as an indigenous person in a majoritarian indigenous uh, republic for the first time in the history of the republic is obviously a big deal. Any any kind of account would need to to take this seriously. Um, um, but what was what was and not just the president, but the but the entire um, Forces that brought him to office and, and the and the bureaucratic transformations of the civil service and so on. So representation in this in this sense, uh, and a sense that there was you know that 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 there was some representation of the population that actually, as it actually existed in in office. Um, but uh, there was a I think there's a one reference is Obama, another reference is the ANC in in South Africa in ninety four and and so and that's a sort of uh, in, 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 in different but parallel ways, that there's also a, a uh, more negative analogy to be made, right? In the sense that obviously Mandela's election was was an important democratic breakthrough, but the the trajectory of the ANC was was even more starkly to be to be on an illiberal path than in, than in Morales's case. But but I think what Alvaro Garcia Linera particularly did was, as vice president, was theorize. Uh, a separation of struggles in an artificial way. I think this was this is my one of the critiques I have of the ideological program which played out politically 
Uh, and that was to say, as as Garcia Linera did early on, that there was that this was a democratic and cultural revolution and not a social revolution. I mean, that's just objectively true. It wasn't a social revolution, but but that it but that it might have been or might have approximated a social revolution. I don't think was out of the question um, in in an earlier period. And so to separate out this phases, sort of delay the social revolution to later, and right now we're having a democratic cultural revolution, was right away to separate out the uh, the material realities of indigenous people. They're not, you know, workers on Monday and indigenous peoples on Tuesday and something else on Thursday. Uh, they're all these things. Uh, and so you, you can't culturally and democratically liberate someone from 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 one component of their of their life. And so this was a, this was an issue. The last point on the right, because I think this is very crucial, um, not just the right, but also imperialism in, in two different ways, because it's often used uh, in an overly static way, I think, and it needs to be understood much more dynamically. And, and, and that is uh, the right was, I think, in the first period of Morales, not a significant threat. Uh, and this needs to be very heavily emphasized. It was massively defeated. Uh, U.S. imperialism was massively overextended in wars in the Middle East and elsewhere. This was the least threatening period of, and if the World Bank and IMF had they basically, basically retreated from Latin America entirely because of the uh, because of the commodities boom allowed for uh, a, remo a, a mo room for maneuver, even for center left governments that was totally unprecedented in the 1990s. So this that reading is important because it suggests that what was possible there was a much more audacious uh, attack on capital early. And it only could have happened then, not at any time, because obviously the right wasn't going to remain weak. Uh, and and uh, uh, But to compromise right away, which is what I think the biggest, I mean, if you view it from above, this was the biggest limit. Um, it was an overestimation of the, of the threat of a coup at the beginning. Um, I think if there had been, if there was going to be a coup, it would have already happened uh, at various stages, key stages, because, because it was attempted and, and, and failed massively. And so the idea that the threat was so imminent that we couldn't proceed, we had to proceed very slowly, was a curse because it said, if, well, of course they were going to negotiate because they're in a position of weakness. So they were happy to negotiate. They came to the table, they, uh, they negotiated. It's not like they were happy with the new government, but as long as net profitability was high, there was very, very, there was a lot of money to be made in the gas boom, the soy boom, mineral boom, and so on. And so they negotiated until they, they re-articulated their political forces. And then when the commodity boom ends, this is when you see the force of a strengthened right allowed to re-articulate, given time and space to develop, uh, that then, of course, was happy to throw out negotiations and then they're into confrontation because now they were in a position of, of power. So, uh, I mean, I'm not referring to any specific events because I'm trying not to go on and on, but as a very cursory balance of forces assessment, that would be my first, my first overview. So I would like to, uh, start by making a very general point uh, regarding uh, the question of uh, political uh, representation. I do not think that uh, uh, the concept uh, of political uh, representation uh, uh, provides us with a very effective uh, uh, key to uh, understanding the relations between uh, uh, progressive governments and social movements uh, in Latin America. You know, uh, sociology of uh, uh, social movements usually explains that movements uh, raise demands and then comes the uh, leftist government that implements the uh, demands. I think uh, this is a framework uh, that does not uh, work either uh, uh, politically uh, or uh, uh, theoretically. What we have seen uh, in Latin America since uh, uh, the early 2000s uh, 
has been the emergence uh, of uh, movements uh, that uh, were constitutively in excess with respect to uh, the possibility of a political representation. In other words, uh, there was always a kind of rest in those movements, uh, and maybe it is precisely this rest uh, that matters uh, more. Also in Bolivia, if uh, we go back to 2000, to the uh, water war in Cochabamba, the gas wars in El Alto, well, it's very clear that the mass, the uh, party of Morales, uh, uh, was part of uh, those uh, uh, insurgencies, uh, but uh, it uh, did not control them at all. There was something in the very composition of the movements that escaped political representation. And I think this is a very general point, but a point that we should keep in mind, not only looking at the early 2000s, but also looking at the present. Representation uh, has often uh, uh, become a co-optation in uh, uh, the uh, working of uh, uh, progressive governments uh, with respect to social movements, and this happened also in uh, Bolivia. So back to the question of uh, accomplishments and uh, limitation. Uh, speaking of Bolivia, it is clear that uh, the indigenous question uh, is the main question. And uh, as both Michael and Jeff were saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, early years uh, of uh, the Morales government uh, were a kind of revolution in this uh, respect. Uh, if you think back uh, to the pictures of uh, indigenous people entering the parliament, uh, I mean, they were so powerful. They kind of uh, instantiated uh, a powerful rupture with uh, a century long uh, uh, logic of exclusion of uh, indigenous populations. Of course, the situation became uh, much. Uh, more complicated uh, in the following uh, years. There were uh, conflicts, for instance, uh, between uh, uh, the majoritarian uh, uh, indigenous groups, uh, uh, the Aymara and the Quechua, and uh, other indigenous uh, nationalities. And I think that also the Tipnis uh, conflict uh, had a lot to do with uh, such conflicts. There were also kind of deep transformations within indigenous groups. New hierarchies emerged, in a way, due to the success of uh, uh, the policies of uh, the government. So the uh, project of decolonization remains uh, unaccomplished, but uh, it is important to add that uh, it must be reframed under uh, completely new conditions uh, today. Then uh, uh, another uh, uh, point uh, has to do with uh, uh, free access to universities. That was also a kind of uh, uh, radical measure. At the same time, uh, uh, you can see that uh, universities themselves uh, did not really change. <laughs> they remained uh, deeply hierarchical uh, and uh, uh, in a way uh, uh, shaped by logics of uh, exclusion. <laughs> What was not uh, really uh, considered uh, was the need to imagine uh, new uh, possibilities for uh, a university graduates that uh, became uh, very numerous in uh, uh, 
the last uh, years. So you see here a kind of, let's say formal, but it is not only formal, uh, uh, measure on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, uh, a difficulty to uh, really change such an important uh, uh, structure as the university, as well as its uh, relation with uh, the labor market. Mm -hmm. A last point that uh, maybe uh, we will uh, discuss uh, more uh, later on uh, uh, has to do with extraction, has to do with the uh, kind of deepening of uh, extractive uh, activities that uh, uh, created uh, the conditions through uh, extractive rent for uh, new policies uh, against uh, poverty. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, there has been uh, a, a huge uh, and very heated uh, debate on so-called neo-extractivism in uh, Latin America. In a way, uh, one could say that uh, uh, Bolivia, in uh, uh, the years of the Morales uh, government, uh, attempted to gain control on uh, extraction activities through the limited uh, nationalization of gas, for instance, uh, that Jeff uh, was uh, mentioning. Uh, but it did uh, not uh, really attempt uh, to uh, use uh, the extractive rent uh, to uh, produce a kind of qualitative leap in uh, economic and social uh, uh, and social development. Moreover, uh, it is very important uh, uh, to uh, stress again what uh, Jeff uh, was saying, which means uh, uh, the commodity boom that uh, provided the framework for uh, the policies of uh, progressive governments uh, in uh, Latin America. In a way, it is uh, kind of uh, striking that uh, most uh, progressive governments, I'm thinking, for instance, uh, of uh, uh, Brazil, uh, did not realize that uh, the crisis of 2007 and 2008 was uh, uh, doomed to uh, hit Latin America, as it happened in a uh, uh, couple of years, you know. I remember reading a, an interview uh, with Marco Aurelio, one of the most important advisors to President Lula in 2008, uh, where uh, uh, he said that uh, uh, the crisis, uh, the financial crisis, uh, uh, regarded only the North and was an opportunity for uh, uh, Latin America. You know? And this is a kind of diagnose uh, that uh, uh, did not prove <laughs> particularly, <laughs> particularly uh, right, you know. So I think this is an important point. This is a, a kind of turning point in the history of uh, the first cycle of uh, uh, progressive governments, also because uh, in the wake of uh, the financial crisis, uh, the dynamic of uh, uh, regional, continental, integration that had been so important in the previous years came to a stop. And so uh, we uh, witnessed a kind of uh, shift uh, to the nation in many of uh, those governments. I think, for instance, of uh, uh, Cristina Kirchner uh, in Argentina and her uh, project of pacification of uh, uh, the Argentinian economy, which was a complete failure, of course, but uh, instantiated in a quite effective uh, way this kind of turn toward uh, the national dimension, which was also a turn toward uh, uh, left populism.
because left populism was not invented after the crisis of 2007 and 2008, but uh, it became more important uh, in those years. Let me let me just play a setup role and, uh, and uh, with with regard to something that Sandro had said, which is that um, let me pose it in the soup in the crass way to allow the two of you to to give a less vulgar uh, version of it, which is that with regard to extraction and and state uh, subsidies, let's say that Sandro was mentioning, I have in in Bolivia, but also in Ecuador and in, in, in other countries, I've often witnessed the debate where uh there would be a kind of um rejection of what's characterized as the european left uh uh criticism of extractivism that says look we need the rent from the extractivism you know from the oil industry or something like that to feed the poor and that you're giving us um ecological arguments and other things you know that these are these are your arguments, not ours. You know, and, and Jeff, if you and I can be included in the in the European left on this, I that's I don't mind. Um, but but uh, you know, so it's being posed. I I read it often as this, or even in you know Franck Poupeau's book about about Bolivia, he he more or less makes this kind of proposition that it's uh, um, that that question about that the criticisms of the Evo Morales government and its economic policy is external to the realities of of which require of 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 Bolivia itself, which requires the um, the influx of of wealth from the from the extractive industries in order to uh, for subsidy programs or for or for addressing poverty, etc. I, I mean, I think this is I, I, like I say, I, I'm. I think this this posing the debate in this way, the way it's often posed, is too crude. But I thought it might set up that that you be both of you are specialists on this question about extraction and and uh, economic development. So I just thought it might be a way of clarifying if if one or both of you could enter into you know I don't know what's wrong with this debate. How do you how do you how do you move it forward? Something like that. I'm trying to play the straight guy. Do you, should I start? Please, yeah, yeah, please, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's, there's lots of dimensions to the debate. I, don't, I mean, I think it's helpful to put it uh, in, the, in that stark terms at first because that captures something real, not just to, because the, the, the real debate is crude. <laughs> it's not, it's not, I mean, there's lots of complexity after that, but, um, um, but it, that is normally, I think it captures something real about the, the politics of the debate, because one of them is this sort of real politic of, um, look, uh, it's, a, it's, it's romantic, uh, it's, it's this kind of romantic green imperialism to imagine that Bolivia could qualitatively transform its, uh, its conditions of life uh, inside of this uh, domineering uh, world capitalist system and the imperial domination from abroad. Um, and, and so the best that you could hope for um, in, in given the constraints were a uh, kind of improvement in, in the capture of rent and the distribution of that rent to the poor. The, so there are many reasons. So I, I'm not sympathetic to this. It, I mean, it points to some obvious things that are real. Uh, because I mean, it wouldn't have the pull ideologically that it did if it didn't speak to something real, right? <laughs> so the real aspects of it are that yes, we live in a uh, world capitalist system which is hierarchically organized, uh, and the imperial relations that Bolivia uh, experiences externally to it, and also how that manifests internally, are, are massive constraints. But again, they're not these static constraints uh, on uh, which are all the time the same and and therefore Bolivia is destined to this kind of repeat um, uh, repeat its dynamics um, uh, and and basically there's nothing Bolivians can do about it because that's what they that's effectively what you're saying uh, if you accept that uh, that basic uh, discourse um, but there's there's 
even in social democratic terms, because that whole discourse assumes that all that is possible now is capitalist development, capitalist industrialization with uh, with more state regulation. That I mean, that is what they are saying. Uh, some people more explicitly and honestly, and others calling it democratic socialism or some other name. But this is this is what they're in policy terms they're suggesting is is possible. That's what that's the horizon of the possible. Is it kind of the way the form that social democracy assumes in in, in the in the global south uh, and in Bolivia in particular. And so <clears throat> this is a failure of, of political imagination and strength on the part of social democracy because, because the aims even of social democracy in the post-war period in, in Latin America were always that we can't be a commodity producing uh, exclusively uh, rent extraction um, uh, uh, region uh, precisely because uh, commodities don't remain high in this kind of and there's a secular tendency for us to reinforce our uh, our um, our subordination inside the international division of labor. So even if you accept this kind of national framework of, you know, what what's important is what happens to our national working class. Even in that restricted framework, which I don't accept, uh, it's it's a it's a failure of imagination even on those terms. The the the, the real politic of this question that there's nothing we can do just extract rent when the rent is high give it to poor people and then suffer through the periods in which commodities are low. And meanwhile, the earth burns and we all sort of, uh, you know, there's nothing that can be done. It has to be done in, 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 the, in the centers of accumulation, which are elsewhere. So it's a completely fatalistic politics of defeat uh, framed as a, as a kind of um, uh, social democratic um, anti-imperialism. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite hostile to it, obviously, but the, but the there's there's obviously critiques to be made of the of of the other caricature side, which although a caricature has real elements again, which is the the, the sort of end to end to extractivism sort of tomorrow, uh, and there are no constraints on our, on what we can do socially and politically in in whatever conditions, um, but but on balance I'm 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 sympathetic to a transition away from capitalist extractivism because uh, I mean if you're not I just think you're insane as a, a in the contemporary uh, world ecological situation you, you cannot be sane and say that what we need is is uh, more I, well, I shouldn't pose it that dramatically but it, we what we need is more of the same a quantitatively uh, expansive capitalist system and there are no limits to the earth uh, and um, and we just need to redistribute our wealth, and and I think what this what this suggests is just again the sense in which um, uh, the imagination of social democracy and for some socialists has become uh, merely quantitative, that is redistributive and quantitative, more consumption of the same, more more goodies, and what what would count as qualitative expansion in Bolivia would be. Uh, that they have access to uh, consumer goods in the same way that, uh, that that we do in the north, as if as if people in the north were liberated. You know, <laughs> we have we've already achieved our emancipation here. Uh, there, it has to still catch up. So it's it's just. A, a, um, but the real question, then, I mean, the, the, for me, the real question, the real interesting part is people. Okay, setting those people aside, the real question is, you know, what is possible under the constraints of a particular concrete situations, um, and and what kinds of transitional uh, dynamics might be might be possible, um, and uh, and there, uh, you know, I think there 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 was a moment. I mean, the, the what ifs are very difficult. These what if questions, but they're necessary. These these counterfactuals. But in but in Bolivia, what if in the early period you had had, you know, a much much more dramatic agrarian reform uh, as 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 was being demanded, but was uh, denied by the mass government because precisely they estimated that the soy producers were going to react in a in a with a coup should their land be um, be touched. Um, but if you talk about agroecological transformation, this, this absolutely has to happen in Bolivia. You need a fundamental agrarian reform a, a, and a qualitative distribution of land, not merely um, more small, 
more smallholders amidst amidst large accumulation. Um, and uh, so that needs to be, you need to have a plan of conflict with agrarian capital. It can't be a plan of negotiation. There has to be a strategy of conflict and expropriation and socialization of land. Um, uh, and that can qualitatively transform lives in ways that won't look similar to industrialization in the North, but that ought not to be the aim anyway, nor is it a return to kind of a primitivist, um, you know, pre-technology, whatever caricature someone wants to make of that argument, right? There are very sophisticated agroecological arguments being made. Um, and with the nationalization of gas, of course, you can, you, the nationalization, even if it had been an actual nationalization, still wouldn't have been socialism, right? The question is the socialization of planning, the socialization of, of, um, of, of posing these questions in non-technocratic ways so that people who are living in Bolivia uh, might have a chance to, um, uh, to actually shape um, the decision-making under the constraints as they understand them, right? And this was, this was very, very far from being achieved. And it wasn't just that they didn't, I mean, Garcia Leonardo, I, I, I blame him a lot for the, the theoretical impulse behind this because he was, uh, he very much is, is extremely hostile, despite an earlier book, which is very interesting on the Tipneys, where you can learn much about the actual character of the Tipneys. Um, in his later understanding of this, it was just, you know, uh, you, uh, you just have to accept that the aim for the next 100 years in Bolivia is indus capitalist industrialization. He's very frank about it. Capitalist industrialization on a large scale with, the, with a big role for the state. Um, I don't know. I don't imagine. I, I can't imagine what he thinks that the world is going to be like in a hundred years uh, in this framework. I mean, it, it just makes no sense. So the real debate is on what kind of transition, what kind of social forces can carry it about, and no doubt it has to be international uh, on scale for it to work. But if it's, um, uh, but there's no reason why it can't start in Bolivia and not <laughs> not somewhere else. It did start in Bolivia. It didn't, it didn't start. Elsewhere. So, if anyone is being sort of imperial in their thinking, it's precisely the view that that limits the horizons of most of the world to, you know, basically the developmental state and you know cope with the repercussions of of uh, ecological crisis because you can't avoid it. So allow me to get back uh, to the rough way in which uh, uh, Michael asks uh, his uh, question. I have always been uh, sensitive uh, uh, to the question of poverty. I think uh, uh, in many uh, discussions of extractivism in Latin America, the need to uh, struggle against uh, uh, poverty is not uh, taken uh, uh, seriously enough. Mm. The fight against uh, poverty uh, has also its uh, uh, peculiar temporality. Mm. You have to do something now. Mm. So this is just uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, I can understand, you know, the uh, strategy of uh, the uh, progressive governments in uh, the early 2000s to uh, take uh, uh, the opportunity of the commodity boom to accumulate rent, hmm. fight poverty. Hmm. But you were saying that uh, uh, the criticism of uh, extractivism is often considered uh, in uh, countries like Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, as coming from the European left. Hmm. But this is not true. Hmm. This is not true uh, thinking of uh, uh, important names, important scholars uh, who have articulated the uh, kind of systematic critique uh, of uh, neo-extractivism over the last uh, uh, 
years uh, in uh, Latin America, this is not true thinking of uh, uh, the movements <laughs> that uh, uh, are uh, part of uh, uh, this uh, critical work. And I'm thinking of uh, indigenous uh, movements, but also of uh, uh, metropolitan <laughs> Uh, movements uh, that have uh, developed the kind of uh, specific sensitiveness uh, to uh, the ecological issues connected uh, to uh, extraction. And then coming to Bolivia, we know very well that uh, uh, Bolivia uh, was uh, uh, incorporated uh, in the capitalist uh, world system uh, through extractive activities, uh, at least uh, since uh, the late 16th century, you know, Potosi, the silver of Potosi, and so on. That is a, that is a history, that is a kind uh, of uh, accumulation <laughs> historical accumulation of uh, experiences, uh, structures, uh, wealth. Uh, it's not easy to break with uh, such uh, a century long uh, uh, process of accumulation. But there is a need to break. There is a need to break for the reasons that uh, uh, Jeff was uh, mentioning. And in particular, uh, I also share his concern with the issue of transition. Transition uh, in uh, uh, many senses, you know, ecological transition, energy transition, transition to socialism and even to communism. I mean, we should uh, try to think uh, all these different uh, uh, meanings of transition uh, uh, together, or at least within uh, a, a common uh, uh, framework. Mm. So let me uh, say that uh, uh, I do not think uh, that uh, the solution can be a kind of a radical stop to uh, extractive activities. Mm. Uh, you know, most civilizations in world histories uh, have uh, extracted the resources uh, from uh, the earth. So uh, the point is uh, uh, how to extract and uh, to what aim to uh, extract. More generally, even more generally, I think that the problem is to uh, criticize uh, uh, in a radical uh, way purely extractive economies, purely extractive economies, which means uh, economies uh, uh, whose dynamics is entirely uh, predicated upon uh, extraction. We know very well that such economies generate corruption, generate poverty, generate uh, hierarchy and uh, inequalities. You know, I remember, uh, uh, I think in 2006, we went, uh, Michael was there, to uh, Venezuela. And uh, we spent a couple of weeks uh, basically in uh, Caracas, and it was uh, uh, very clear that uh, uh, the uh, kind of strategic decision of the Venezuelan government was to go on with an economy entirely centered upon oil. I remember discussions with the comrades uh, there. And uh, uh, we were raising this uh, question. And many comrades uh, uh, were sensitive to uh, the question uh, itself. But uh, I would uh, uh, add that uh, the problems of Venezuela in the last uh, 10 years have also, not only, but have also to do with this purely extractive uh, economic uh, structure. 
So I think that uh, in uh, a situation like uh, uh, the one of Venezuela, it was reasonable at the beginning to uh, uh, exploit uh, oil, the oil uh, rent, to start uh, to fight against the poverty. But uh, uh, it is precisely here that uh, uh, the question of uh, transition arises. You have uh, to imagine ways to go beyond this purely uh, extractive uh, uh, structure of the economy. This is maybe in uh, countries like uh, Venezuela and even Bolivia, uh, the main political question, the main strategic uh, question. And as far as I am concerned, I think that uh, uh, movements and struggles have crucial roles to play in uh, kind of uh, uh, forcing uh, such uh, a uh, transition. What, has, what I was saying before about uh, the excess, the rest uh, that characterizes uh, social movements in Latin America with respect to the logic of uh, political uh, uh, representation is for me very important here. Huh? You have to imagine a kind of combination of action from below and even from above in order to make uh, uh, such a, uh, a transition uh, possible. And you have to fight against capitalism. Maybe you will have to uh, negotiate with some capitalist uh, interests and uh, actors, but uh, this is the only way to uh, imagine a, a kind of politics of transition towards socialism. I, I'm grateful to the two of you for making something actually intelligent out of my um, uh, crass formulation that it's opposing it that way, which is um, which is great. One of the things that strikes me, and this is in line with with what both of you have been saying, I think, you know, which is that maybe even this is a way of posing it as a kind of irony, which is that in the uh, first years of the Morales government, you know, let's say from 2006 to 2009 or so. There was both the economic and the political possibility for uh, the radical transformation. You know, the as as Jeff was saying earlier, the the threat of the right was less, and that as both of you have been emphasizing, the commodities boom provided a certain kind of economic possibility. But but and and that that economic transformation did not happen in those years and was not. But um, today, you know. Uh, over a decade after that, we have both the, uh, in some ways, unfavorable economic conditions and unfavorable political conditions in the sense of what I see at least as a very threatening, even if they were disorganizing chaotic, right, but very violent, right, racist, um, threatening. At least I'm reading, you know, from the 2019 coup onwards. And so the... I guess I would. I wanted to um, maybe ask you two to develop a little bit more, or think a little bit more about what the um, what the margins of possibility and the uh, are today, you know, for like for economic transition, but also political transition, um, given a context of of um, of political threat. Or maybe, maybe, but maybe you two think I'm I'm exaggerating these two threats and a and an economic, at least you know, at least not a favorable economic condition like we had during um, you know 20 years ago. Um, I don't think that there isn't room for maneuver. I, mean, I don't mean to be posing it that way, but I, I guess I wanted to uh, pose these outlines and and think what. Um, what the what the possibilities are, which uh, which also could be answered at the at the continental Latin American level, you know what the uh, possibilities are. So I guess I would I would start with just since since I shouldn't just be the one. I mean, at least let me, let me pose two possibilities for this one to think about. One is just picking up what what Sandra just said, which is in Bolivia and, and in coordination, preferably with in other Latin American countries, that the um, 
that in some sense, such a transformation has to be led by the movements. You know, I, 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 don't, ex I don't expect through the initiative of, of the um, progressive governments, if the ones that exist today, I mean, think about Lula or Boric, you know, Colombia and Petro, you know, that I think, and in Bolivia too, with, with the MAS and Arce government, um, either because of uh, other, what you call them, political limitations or just the limitations of their power, uh, I don't look to them for the possibility of a um, initiative of either political or economic transformation. It seems to me that it would have to come from uh, from the movements, which, uh, okay, I could just say that far, which isn't saying very much yet because one would have to go further. But maybe also at the level, uh, at the level of both movements and governments, um, this is more of a wish than a, than a something else, which is that the it seems to me that only in conjunction with other governments and creating regional bloc can such uh, transformations have such such power. And it's something that um, I think maybe Sandro mentioned this earlier that that there was um, in the early two thousands, you know, from Lula to Chavez. Uh, and various others, there were many discussions about uh, continental projects, you know, about uh, even, and, and there are again today about uh, about transformation of money, perhaps. There was the idea of the bank earlier, there are other. Um, so it seems to me, I guess these are the two avenues that I would pursue, even though I've said very little about them so far, which is that it would be the maybe the excess that Sandra was talking about of the movements would be the um, necessary for such a transformation to take place. And the other is that one has to think at a larger than national level in order to discover the resources necessary today for such a thing. Yeah, and I don't mean to uh, pose it, and I hope our discussion doesn't sound like to others, because I'm pretty sure that the three of us don't see it this way, as if, um, I don't know, like we're all fucked. It's never going to happen, you know. Whatever. It's not that the, the current situation is not so bad. You know, there are avenues of possibilities today, and that's what I, I, I guess it would be. Seems to be worth trying to uh, emphasize that, uh, despite many obstacles, there, there, um, there are such ones. So anyway, I was just posing two, and even just very roughly, you know, about the movements and about the continental concept. Uh, correspondences. I'll stop there. One of you choose to jump in. Maybe I can start this time. So it uh, is even uh, redundant uh, to say uh, that uh, uh, the current conjuncture is totally different uh, from the one of uh, the uh, first decade of uh, the century. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, uh, I agree uh, with uh, Michael. I think there are avenues. There are uh, uh, possibilities. Although uh, we have to stress uh, that uh, uh, we are living through a kind of uh, tumultuous uh, transition at the global level shaped by actual war and by specters of other possible wars. So uh, there are dangers, but I think there are also uh, possibilities. There are possibilities uh, uh, regarding Latin America Above all, uh, if uh, we look uh, at uh, uh, the regional dimension, hmm. I do not think that uh, uh, current uh, progressive uh, presidents, uh, uh, for instance, in Brazil, uh, in uh, Bolivia, in uh, Colombia, hmm, or even in Argentina and Chile, hmm, will be able 
to uh, make uh, uh, substantial contributions uh, to the kind of uh, uh, perspective uh, of uh, transition that uh, I was roughly outlining uh, before. From this point of view, uh, the power of innovation uh, lies on the side of movements and uh, struggles. And there are a lot of movements and struggles in Latin America. This is something uh, we have uh, uh, to keep in mind. Nonetheless, uh, the establishment of uh, uh, regional frameworks of uh, integration uh, can uh, contribute uh, to uh, open up uh, new spaces, uh, even for uh, struggles and uh, movements. I think that uh, from this point of view, uh, the first months of uh, Lula presidency uh, have been uh, quite encouraging, you know. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, we should talk now of uh, uh, complex issues, uh, starting with uh, the simultaneous presence uh, in Latin America of the US uh, and China. This is something that matters, that matters a lot if we talk about uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, regional uh, integration. Mm -hmm. Michael was uh, mentioning the issue of uh, money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also think that uh, uh, the proposal of uh, the Brazilian government uh, to start again the process toward uh, a common currency in Latin America is crucially important. And I think that uh, uh, it is also uh, interesting uh, that Lula decided to start uh, this project uh, with uh, Fernandez, uh, uh, the president of uh, Argentina. You know, in Argentina, which is the second economy in the region, uh, the question of uh, uh, the currency is uh, uh, a vexed question. Nowadays, uh, as uh, we speak, uh, the rate of inflation in Argentina is 108.8%. And uh, it is easy uh, to imagine what it means for uh, uh, popular classes in uh, that country. But it is also easy to imagine what it means uh, for the government of Anibal uh, uh, Fernandez. For the last year of government of uh, Fernandez, because this year uh, there will be presidential elections. You know, with the inflation uh, well above uh, 100%, uh, you cannot do anything. You are paralyzed. No uh, monetary politics, of course, uh, no uh, economic politics, uh, no social politics. Of course, behind that, uh, you have uh, uh, the agreement with uh, uh, the International Monetary Fund that was signed by Macri, the neoliberal president, before Fernandez, and uh, uh, renegotiated by Fernandez. But the question of uh, uh, currency is uh, uh, nonetheless uh, uh, crucial. How do you tackle this question? How do you solve this question? You know, in the 1990s, uh, the neoliberal government of uh, Menem had a solution, dollarization. We should look for another solution, you know. For me, it is quite difficult to find a solution uh, uh, within the borders of uh, Argentina. And I repeat, uh, this question uh, uh, limits in a radical way the uh, very possibility of action of movements and struggles in that country. I think this is uh, an important issue in itself. I repeat, uh, there will be uh, election in November this year in Argentina, and Argentina is the second uh, economy in 
the region. But it is also important uh, uh, as a, a kind of uh, symptomatic question. I think that there are many important uh, problems and issues uh, that can be tackled in uh, an effective way uh, within a framework of uh, integration. And this also uh, regards the necessary negotiation both with, with the US and with China. Jeff was rightly saying before that uh, in the first decade of the century, the US were kind of uh, uh, absent in uh, the region. You know, their presence had been weakened by a series of factors that uh, he mentioned. But now the situation is different. The situation is different, uh, which means that Latin America can become one of the stages of the confrontation and even clash between uh, the US uh, and China. So from this point of view, you know, a country like Bolivia cannot negotiate uh, uh, with uh, China and the US in an effective way. If you have uh, a regional kind of uh, dimension, well, it is different. It is different. So from this point of view, I really think uh, that uh, because of the conjuncture we are uh, living through, this dimension of uh, regional uh, integration uh, is uh, strategically relevant also from the point of view of uh, uh, the creation of the conditions for uh, the transition, let's say, towards socialism that uh, uh, we both were uh, mentioning uh, and uh, discussing in a very rough way before. Mm -hmm. may, may I say uh, um, a few words based on what both of you were saying in the initial questions posed by, or, or framework posed by Michael, um, the, I think it's useful to start at the, you know, the, even the world level and then region, regional dynamics, uh, precisely because we, one can get caught up in the specific, uh, this, this or that specific aspect of, of crisis and sort of fail to think about the unity of some of these, some of these things. Um, and so if we begin, you know, with the, the world scenario in relation to Latin America, what Sandra was saying was exactly correct, that the 2008 crisis it was phenomenal during the first few years, how um, not just the Brazilian advisors, but in Argentina and elsewhere, uh, were convinced that there was going to be a Keynesian regulatory way out of this in Latin America, and we, we weren't going to suffer a crisis. Um, of course, China managed to delay its crisis by a few years, and this helped literally by several percent of GDP, most of Latin America in relation, right? Um, but once China slowed down every year since 2011, um, as so did the commodity uh, stimulus in, in Latin America, uh, which obviously had differential effects on different countries, but it was, a big, it was a big issue for most of the countries we're talking about, which are part of the so-called pink tide. So that was that was one thing um, it, that we should hold those economists to account, <laughs> and because when the next uh, when the next uh, dynamic dynamism resurges or the next then 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 that we should call into question the ease with which Keynesianism is going to be or or some version of Keynesianism is going to be uh, offered again, which it which it will be by certain forces. Um, so that was one thing. There was, there was no outside to this crisis. The crisis was global in proportion in Latin America, felt in, in specific ways, unevenly. And the, and the inter-imperial crisis or inter-imperial dynamics that we're experiencing now also aren't new, but they were exaggerated by these, by these, same, these same rhythms, although they, they're not reducible to the, to the, to the crisis. Um, and I think that's one point to start out with uh, also is to recognize that this is, for me, an inter-imperial dynamic. We need to understand China also as imperial in the in its relationship to Latin America, because one of the big debates on part of the left, and particularly 
to put it crudely, the statist part of the left, um, is that China is, is more of a model and a partner in the in the alliance against and you need to you need to uh, engage with China in order to distance yourself from the US, which was the historic and therefore still contemporary most threatening presence in, in the region. I think this is a real mistake for all kinds of reasons that I obviously don't have time to defend, but I think it's important to to, to think of this. Neither of these places are going to save you. Um, uh, or, or be forces of, of, of emancipation in, in the region. But they're both going to play a massive role in whatever happens uh, in Latin America in the coming period. And just the, 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 the last thing on that world regional dynamic is that the, the pandemic in uh, the COVID pandemic in, in, in Latin America in 2020 was, was by most accounts of, I mean, this, we're still calculating that, but by, you know, the most, reliable thing is usually considered to be excess mortality, right, beyond the normal mortality rate of, and uh, the numbers are are uh, extraordinary for Latin America. I mean, they, um, and, but, but what is, so that's sometimes recognized, obviously recognized by people in global health, but, but elsewhere it's sometimes recognized, but it's not often linked to the fact that you are already coming through a four year, uh, sorry, a five year period of economic contraction and in most places economic recession, a very dire recession having to do with the global capitalist crisis and its delayed reverberation to Latin America. So 2014 to 2019 in South America as a region, aggregate region, experienced its, its lowest level of GDP growth on an aggregate scale ever in history between 2014 and 2019. Not, And so people were saying that the, the new pink tide wasn't exhausted. They were denying that there's any change, qualitative change. We're just living in, in a planet that had nothing to do with the planet that we uh, that we live on. There was a massive crisis uh, and it expressed itself politically in different ways. And then the contraction economically it, it, it was, was accelerated and intensified by the dynamics of the pandemic. And now the dynamics of the, of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in terms of food and energy prices and inflation and so on. So all of this is happening with the new debates around the new pink, whatever, the new pink tide or the new, the new wave of governments, right? But I think what's actually happening is at that electoral level, which is another thing we need to move away from, is the focus on electoral rhythms exclusively. But this, this electoral level is both, you know, the new, the so-called new wave of, you know, the short-lived uh, Castillo government in Peru, uh, Castro in, in Honduras, uh, and, and more famously uh, Preto in, in Colombia, and so on, um, or and AMLO. Whether you in, in Mexico, whether you include that as part of the old wave or the new wave, because he should have been elected in 2006, which would make him part of the old wave, but he actually came to office later. Um, whatever, you know, there's that new wave is. Happened at the same time as parts of the old wave were, um, you know, returning to office in 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 Argentina and in Bolivia, and and now in in Brazil. Um, and so, you know, the the sort of optimists, of, like the hyper optimists, uh, are saying, you know, well, everything is great because this time we have <laughs> we have control of the biggest countries. You know, Brazil is back in the arms of the PT. We have. We have Colombia, we have major economies in Argentina, and so on. Um, and but even taking the more serious people uh, among that among that wave, I think we need to assess more deeply and more honestly um, the what failed in that first period and how it's not going to just start from any new project is not going to start from zero a, a, a blank state, but has to wrestle with. You know Venezuela and Nicaragua, which are you know everyone doesn't talk about anymore because they, you've moved on. That now we look at new hopeful elements. I think it pays to revisit places that were looked at. I mean Nicaragua wasn't wasn't the most recent area that people celebrated, but but you know it's it's comparable to Venezuela in terms of the the acceleration of a kind of bureaucratic sclerosis um, on a major scale. But even the failings also, which I think we're going to, rec we're still going to, I'm less optimistic than, than Sandro, I think, on Brazil and the early signs of the Lula government. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm very happy that Bolsonaro was not elected. <laughs> That's not my point. But the, 
but the but we need to reckon with the way in which the PT um, explains uh, the limits of the PT also explains the existence of Bolsonaro, right? And so the the idea that the PT's return is going to easily I'm not saying you were suggesting it would be easy, but it's going to solve it or, or even begin to solve the problem. Uh, I think we we can we can question that. And in Argentina, you know, it's true that the hyperinflationary crisis that they're currently in, it seems impossible to maneuver now, but we need to look back 12 months to what they settled on with the IMF and whether that was all they could have settled on. Uh, because when they did settle, they, you know, Jeffrey Sachs, the same people who thought there could be a, you know, Jeffrey Sachs, the, the, the chameleon who used to be the neoliberal mastermind of these places and now is the, you know, I'm happy he became a social democrat, but he, his new idea of regulating your way out of capitalism, sorry, regulating your rate of capitalist crisis, uh, he too was celebrating the IMF agreement as some kind of a progressive, uh, but if you measure, but they kicked the can down the road effectively without eliminating any debt in, in Argentina. So it came back in this massively accelerated way um, uh, at present, which was entirely predictable. And politically, you know, the, the re what you're seeing, I think at the moment is the return of these, of these old lefts the, the 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 Kirchner, I mean, obviously, under Fernandez now not a Kirchner, but the, the return of Peronism in some guys, in a more centrist guise than before. Whatever we thought about the early Kirchner period, the return of the PT on the on a on a further right platform than ever before. The return of Arce as a much denuded version of Morales returning, and. Um, the hopeful, so it's not just, those are the, those are the weak points of, and that needs to be assessed why, why they're returning, but why they have no project and no vision of transformation, whatever the contradictions of transformation were before. They don't even rhetorically have them anymore. They're not committed to transformation, even rhetorically. Whereas earlier you could call into question the rhetoric, but there was a transformative rhetorical posture. And, um, but the real strength, I think, of the moment is both and this gets to the region question is, you know, the transversal movements right now, the, the, the most encompassing promising ones are the resurgence of popular feminism, the resurgence of popular ecology, um, I think are posing these questions both implicitly in some places, explicitly in other places, by the nature of the questions they're posing, in a, uh, pose the question of capitalism much more squarely because, um, because of the, the nature of, of of the of the of what they're struggling around, that is life against capitalism at the kind of slogan slogan of of, of recent popular feminism, and in, I, I want to just agree with Michael about the stress of movements in the sense that whatever the limits of uh, you know there's much to say about organizational form of movement party and state at the at, 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 in the current period, but you know it's not true that all governments came to the, came to office on the wave of movements. AMLO is a good example in Mexico in which this is not the case. It's not that there are not movements in Mexico, obviously, but he didn't come on the back of some rupture as in Chile, as in Colombia, as in Ecuador. And you see that in his, there's no pressure on AMLO to concede anything. Uh, and you have a typically centrist government uh, in office, whereas whatever the contradictions of Preto, whatever the contradictions of the Chilean experiment under Boric, the, the pressure is not constant, but the fact that there needs to be some gesture towards what became came before, and it opens up space, but the momentum will will, will never come from above, in, in, in my opinion. Sorry, I went on there a bit. No, no, that's great. I mean, I thought maybe, and, and this maybe should be, uh, I mean, we should probably wrap up soon, but I, I uh, we've, we've all mentioned some of the movements and I thought it might be useful to just say a little bit more about, like, I, I guess we've all said in some ways that the, uh, at least a large part of the possibility of innovation will come um, from the movements and that it has in the past. So I thought maybe just saying some more about the, the current movements now thinking at a Latin American level as a whole, I mean, that Neo Nemenos in, in Argentina and elsewhere of course, the student movements in Chile 
uh, the movements of Colombia. I mean, I was thinking, yeah, maybe, yeah, could you two fill in a little bit more? I mean, or even just, I'm thinking also just helping with people who are not familiar with things going on. You know, what are the um, dynamics that are most exciting to you? Both of you are excellent people for, yeah, I don't know. Sandra, could you start just saying, I mean, even just thinking about what's, what's most exciting to you or giving people a panorama, whichever one seems better to you. You know, uh, first, uh, I think uh, it is important uh, to stress uh, that uh, uh, in Latin America, if you look at uh, the last four or five years, there were several uh, uh, waves of uh, insurgency. Mm -hmm. Think of uh, Chile, 2019, October, that uh, uh, insurrection, because it was an insurrection, eh? was soon followed by anti-liberal uh, uh, demonstrations with clashes uh, in Ecuador. There was uh, uh, the coup in Bolivia and uh, in uh, uh, the first half of uh, 2020, despite uh, the outbreak uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the resistance was uh, very strong. Then you had Colombia, mm. months of uh, insurgency. Mm. But think also of Peru. Mm. The uh, destitution of uh, Castillo was uh, soon followed by uh, a real uh, uprising that uh, uh, you know uh, was concentrated in specific areas of uh, the uh, country in the interior but this is just to mention uh, uh, the most uh, uh, dramatic uh, moments of insurgency of the last uh, couple of years I think uh, that uh, uh, such uh, a dynamic uh, will continue in uh, the next uh, years with a kind of variable uh, geography, but uh, with uh, uh, the intensity that uh, we have experienced uh, in uh, the last uh, years. Then uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, of course, uh, very important and strong movements in Latin America that, uh, uh, you know, uh, make connections uh, across uh, borders. I would like to uh, focus just a bit on uh, the new feminist movements in Latin America. Starting from Argentina, where uh, in 2015 there was uh, the first big demonstration under the heading uh, Ni una meno, not uh, one uh, less. What I find really interesting uh, in uh, uh, that movement is the fact that uh, it quickly uh, opened a new regional space. <laughs> connecting uh, feminist uh, struggles uh, in such diverse countries as Brazil, Mexico, and Bolivia. Today, there is a regional space, a Latin American space uh, of feminist uh, uh, action. And I think this is uh, very important uh, in itself. And once again, uh, it can also provide a kind of paradigm. What I find uh, interesting also uh, from the point of view of a kind of rethinking of internationalism uh, is that uh, uh, the feminist movement opened up a regional space in Latin America and was immediately 
capable to produce resonances in North America and maybe even more powerfully in Southern Europe, in countries like Spain and uh, uh, Italy. So you have here a kind of uh, geography of uh, uh, struggle that uh, is not uh, a national geography, but it is a kind of uh, rooted geography. It has its uh, points of reference. It's not uh, the abstract uh, global uh, feminist movement. You know. I think this is uh, really, uh, you know, food for thought for uh, people who are uh, interested in rethinking uh, political action beyond the nation and beyond, uh, you know, the traditional patterns of internationalism that was predicated upon the nation as a, a fundamental unit of reference. So I, I, I agree with, us, with with most of that. So I won't repeat uh, the, the parts that uh, Sandra was, uh, I'll just add a few elements. Um, um, I think uh, in, uh, in relation to the question of strategy as well, I think because the, um, I think on the one hand, the, the, to, to start with the less positive and move in the other direction, I think it has to be reckoned with the, the weakening of the movements that constituted um, the, the so-called first wave of the, of the Pink Tide. So not just that we're in a new period of insurgency, but also uh, it's important to recognize that the, there, there was no early resistance to Bolsonaro in a mass way. There, there was no early resistance in a mass way to the coup in Bolivia. Um, and this is very important to understand why this occurred. It had nothing to do with the popularity <clears throat> of these, or not only to do with the popularity of these, uh, of, the, of the new right, um, but also the, just the the weakening of capacities to mobilize. So we're also in a, in a period in which that hasn't recovered. And, the, um, and this will be very serious to determine, you know, near futures in, in the countries that that makes sense. In. And, that, and that the idea of socialism in places like Venezuela and Nicaragua is no longer attractive to so many people uh, because it's associated with these, with these uh, regimes which are hated uh, for good, very good reasons <laughs> um, by their population. So it's, it's, we're not just in a period of of renewal, um, but I don't want to minimize what is new uh, in, in in the current period. So uh, I too, you know, the, the the rebellions that weren't just out of out of nowhere in 2019, 2020, 2021, Chile, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, but in each case were products of earlier cycles that 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 then you know built to a kind of apogee. In these moments, um, so and I think these the, in each case, especially Colombia and Chile, and not just for electoral reasons, these were sort of before and after moments of, of these countries' recent history, right? They, they, they and um, but they were also, I think, it needs to be said, they were even. I'm not sure I would call them insurgencies, but they were massive, and whatever they were. I think it also has to be said though that they were defensive, right? These were in the these were in the most two of the most conservative countries in 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 Latin America, Chile and Colombia, um, in which the right doesn't just have passive support by forty percent of the population, but you know uh, incredible support by forty percent of the population at least, depending like on the hard right. Um, and so in these countries, these were extraordinary precisely because they even happened on the scale that they did but um, um, but that they 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 didn't articulate um, in, in either case an anti-capitalist expressly anti-capitalist movement obviously although there are anti-capitalist inclinations to what was happening but I think they posed the question also that we need to pose if the limits of of strategy on all fronts right movement party, and different party forms. And I think on the, there's a limit to the movements in the sense that the movements alone, I think, cannot transform the region in, in, on their own. 
um, and they and they they atomize and fragment and are more capable of being co-opted without without an organizational form beyond the movement. Um, but the question is, I think, uh, the, assessing the failure both of the historic sect model of the party, um, but also not moving then to uh, minimize the failures, the recent failures of the left populist broad model of party articulation, right? Um, and wrestling with um, what what sorts of strategic articulation is necessary for the moment. And the feminist movement, I, this is my last word on, on for today. The, the feminist movement, I agree, has been the most um, uh, dramatic, transformative movement of, of, of not this or that place even, but as a region-wide dynamic with its areas of strength in different countries. Um, but there too, the same limits are being posed in the sense that, you know, under AMLO in Mexico, where the very important feminist movement emerged in recent years, um, AMLO was very effective. The administration was very effective at uh, demobilizing this by, uh, you know, having AMLO not speak anymore, as, as Massimo Morenesi put it, you know, he's not allowed to speak anymore and it's just all been um, the 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 women ministers of his government that they now speak and embrace some kind of version of of, of, of feminism, um, and uh, and this has split the movement in a way that now AMLO is not no longer seen as a kind of vociferously anti-feminist president, which he is, but um, but as you know, containing contradiction and so on. So we have to we have to relate to him in some way. Um, so, um, I think, you know, there are these, the, the only hope that we have is that is, is the, is the extension, uh, of movements that we've been talking about, but also the discovery of, of a new politics that can, that can articulate them at a higher level. I don't, obviously I'm not going to offer what that is, but, um. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting us to solve the problems um, immediately here, but I think I should probably, given given the time, bring us to a close. And and um, and uh, and I feel that we've have in some ways the the dynamic which which we set out for ourselves of of trying to think both at the level of uh, of Latin America and at the question of Bolivia and, and putting them in context has been. Um, been very successful, even though, of course, there's many much, much more to say about those things. Philip, Michael, can I can I pose one question as a kind of uh, uh, a heuristic question to bring us to the to an end? Uh, imagine that each of you is the president of a Latin American country, say, who is brought into office by a resurgent left movement during a commodities boom. And you have to decide what is the first major initiative you enact. You have two advisors, one of whom says, democratize institutions. Uh, we are going to have, the commodities boom will end. We are going to have a counter-revolutionary attempt, which will be led by an oligarchy that masquerade as a grassroots democracy. What we want to do is take their bases away so we must uh, get rid of the Senate and just have a unicameral house, and we must strip powers from the Supreme Court. The other advisor says, that's wonky stuff. Nobody will understand it. You have people here who uh, haven't, had the haven't had the elements of a decent life for years. You have the ability to uh, redistribute some economic largesse now you should do some kind of Keynesian pump priming and pass those out. Uh, what is your choice? It could be A or B or neither of the above, or that's a conundrum. I wouldn't know how to deal with that. Crap. Who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna jump into that one? Okay, Sandra's telling me I have to. Um, um, 
Yeah. So, so in some ways, you're saying that the alternative of your two advisors is is one saying political transformation, and the other one is saying address poverty without political transformation. Um, and neither of your advisors are are also talking about an economic transformation. You know, like um, trying to transform the economy in a different in a different way, which which also could be, but you know, I, I think, I think one has to refuse these sort of, um, these sort of questions. Um, yeah, it's just any, any solution the one poses like this, it doesn't, it's, it's going to feel false in whatever I actually, uh, try to do. This was, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. When, can one of you? I feel like I, I can see Philip. Philip is posing that this is that it, that in Chile in the early 70s during the Allende period, this was in in some ways part of the part of the debate. I think I'd have to pose it differently now. Jeff and Sandra, you have to jump. You have to. Someone has no, to. Uh, the, the the answer is uh, uh, quite easy. You have to do both. And I know that uh, it uh, is not easy to do both. But uh, you have uh, to refuse uh, the alternative uh, between uh, taking uh, initiative in the field of politics uh, and taking initiative uh, in the field uh, uh, of economy. And this is also because uh, um, redistribution can, uh, in a way, foreshadow uh, a transformation of the economy only if uh, it is predicated upon uh, uh, a democratization of the state. Moreover, in, uh, in, uh, in Bolivia in particular, you know, but uh, also in other Latin American uh, uh, countries, um, there is a kind of colonial imprint in uh, the structures of the state, and you have to address it. So, uh, uh, I repeat, I know that uh, in practice it would not be easy, but uh, the real wager is to combine you know, a kind of ambitious uh, project of political transformation of the state and uh, redistribution and policies that target uh, poverty. Yeah, I mean, I thought of Chile uh, before you said that you were thinking of Chile, <laughs> um, Philip. Uh, the, I mean, the, the to, to in crude in crude terms, the Chilean example is always the debate on the left is whether the lesson was whether Allende went too fast or too slow, right? <laughs> this is the this is the I mean, this is what it reduces to, um, and it's obviously more complicated than this, but the. Um, uh, I think the question of um, of even if even if um, even if one enters the institutions, the democratic institutions of of, a, of an ostensibly liberal democratic state, that is, you come to power through or you come to office through elections, uh, as in the scenario that you've posed, this, uh, but you've come in with this this massive wave of movements. Um, presuming that this massive wave of movements is is oriented towards an actual transformation of a qualitative transformation, I think the preparation. This isn't a policy answer to the question, but the the, the as a general orientation, uh, I would say uh, the the way in which uh, Allende pushed the institutions legally with where he could, um, but then had uh, a residing faith, a misplaced faith in, in those institutions. That is to say uh, that the, that, that replacing this or that figure of the military would, would, would uh, assure their constitutional uh, support that the, 
um, that the arming of the working class would be a problem because uh, even though they were calling for it, because um, this would lead to civil war as if civil war could be evaded in a transformation to socialism. I mean, you would want to minimize it, obviously, but I don't know how you otherwise transform a mode of production into a new one. Um, in this in this scenario, the the ending of capitalism, I think a defensive preparation um, to defend what you've what you've achieved would be necessary, and that would mean necessarily, uh, if you were starting within the institutions of the state, uh, knowing that uh, you would have the the actual power for the transformation would have to come outside of the existing state. Um, uh, and that therefore you would you would be soon be breaking the law <laughs> that you were that you were uh, in charge of. So um, and you would have to allow that to happen, not just allow it to happen, but to be praising it and <laughs> encouraging it. So that would quickly, um, you know, within the obviously within the limits of of your assessment of what was possible in the moment. But uh, but anyway, the scenario is I, I agree with Michael in the sense that. It's not up to the president, um, but forced to to do this. <laughs> that was my attempt. Yeah. Philip, uh, I hope. Philip, I, I hope. Merely heuristic, uh, and not the presentation of a realistic scenario. Even though in 1971 that scenario did exist. Uh, thanks, yeah. Michael. Did you have one other thing to say? Well, I was just going to say, I hope this wasn't an interview for you were considering us for making us president of some country, and we, pro <laughs> we probably failed the um I, I the, would uh, consider you the president of most countries, everybody else, okay. uh, than the ones they have, but uh, I, I don't have enough of a movement to install you, so I will instead just have to thank you for appearing again at Red May uh, and giving us food for thought, as always. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Come back. Michael, are you back in Seattle? All right, soon. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Sandro, we, we need you to come to Seattle sometime. I will, I will. Enjoy out over there in Italy. We're going to go live <laughs> again next year is the plan, totally live. We had four live events this year. Well, uh, next year, uh, I will come. <laughs> so, and Jeff, same thing. Uh, so, bon voyage. Have a nice Thanks rest. Thank you.